it's Douglas Coleman. Hello. Hello. How are you today? I thought I would try this soft voice this time instead of yelling and screaming, Hello! How are you? So we're going to go with the NPR FM voice. Actually, Dave Davis does a much better one than I do. Uh, he must have went to school to learn how to do the NPR voice. <laughs> but it's it's one of those voices where back in the day, you knew they were smoking something because the voice was just a little too mellow. Anyways... How are y'all doing today? We got a good show for you. We have as our special guest, Nathan McCree, who is the music composer for the Tomb Raider games, amongst many other games, and very anxious to talk to him, so he'll be on just a little bit later. But first, I want to introduce my co-host. She is the president and founder of Lady Lake Entertainment, the always light and fluffy Ms. Cindy Diadamo. Hi, Cindy. How are you? Hi, Douglas. Doing great. How are you? Oh, doing good. Um, I noticed your phone was ringing while we were getting set up. You're getting oh, yeah. more telemarketer calls or what? Yeah, you know, it seems that um, these days, all of your phone numbers, your cell phone, if you have a landline, you know, you get on a list which is sold and your number is sold. So you get endless calls from everyone selling everything from soup to nuts. And I've blocked my absolute capacity on my landline. It's just there's no more blocks available, so I'm, I'm out of space. And so there's new people who have come out of the woodwork selling everything from A to Z, you know, human beings on the phone and also those lovely computerized salesmen. Oh, I hate the computer ones. Oh, I hate them. Absolutely. Well, they they pitch everything from, do you want to take a survey so we can have your opinion? And that can go on indefinitely. And who's got the time for that? Or they seem to get, if you've had a service, because I noticed down here when we had our air conditioning serviced, and then we got calls from all other local air conditioning repair places. So I guess they put you on that list and sell that. Your phone number in the olden days, remember when you could buy the private number, you could pay extra to the phone company Unlisted. to have an unpublished number. Right. So everybody and their brother has your number and then they'll call. And depending on what mood I'm in and depending on how much free time I have, sometimes I'll take the salesman or sales lady for a little bit of a ride. <laughs> um, you know, because you know how I am. I also do it on Facebook when I get the random people with the, you know, the crazy questions or whatever. One day, a lady called and she was selling alternative energy. I'm not quite sure how you purchase alternative energy, but evidently there's an alternative to paying your normal light bill, electric bill, you know, whatever it is that you have. Was she selling you, solar panels or something to put I, on your I roof? don't really even know what it was. I think it was just a different supplier of the same stuff you normally get. Oh. So instead of it being a monopoly, like the phone company used to be a monopoly and you could only get it from that phone service because it was hardwired in the wall. Right. Now what they want to say is you don't have to get your power from just that company who is the local one who supplies. You can also buy from them. How? Yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe it's solar. I don't know. But what I told her was we have no electricity in our house that we live in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> but when I told her that we had no electricity at all and we lived in a cave, she didn't know what to say. And that was basically the I threw her off her pitch. Oh, good for you. So that was the yeah. end of that. I just had a thought. You had mentioned the phone company. And I remember back in the day when it was Ma Bell and you had to get all your stuff from them. And when you moved to right. a new house, you had to wait two weeks before you could even get a phone. And then they would bring the phones, all that kind of stuff. What I right. want to know is if you have a landline these days, which is even sort of rare for a lot of people now to have one right. in your house, if you dial zero, do you still get an operator? I have no idea. I have what I call the house phone, which is in a package plan from my cable provider, which is Comcast. So we have internet, TV, right. we have like a, a bundle. Right, you get the but bundle. But does yeah. anybody still have the, what do you, who do you pay for that old fashioned phone? You know, I don't even know how I that don't, works. Well, anymore. I don't think that exists anymore. I think the, the phone company, as it were, Ma Bell, right. I think they're gone. 
AT&T is still around, but that's just like one of many service providers, Sprint, T-Mobile. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, right? I wanted to know if you still get an operator. Are there real human operators anymore or are those all gone? Well, it was funny. Jen and I were watching a movie last night, really old, about um, the war. I think it was like World War II or something. And they showed an old-fashioned phone operator, you know, who wore the headset and with a plug. and the, the switchboards, yeah. Yeah, the switchboard lady. And Jen's like, what? And I said, yeah, back in the olden days, you could get a job as a telephone operator and you had to work a switchboard and plug in all these things. And that's such a thing anymore. Well, first of all, switchboard boards haven't existed since probably the late 60s, early 70s, because they all went computerized. It was a matter of connecting you to networks. So I think the computer actually got rid of the operator, too. I can remember my father in the 70s making person-to-person calls, and you just dialed zero even then and would say, I'd like to make a person-to-person call to so-and-so in New York City, and you'd give the number. A lot of people would sort of scam the phone company because they would set it up beforehand with the person. So if the operator called in and said, I have a person-to-person call from Douglas Coleman, I'd answer the phone and I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, he's not here, right? You wouldn't get charged for the call, but yet it was enough. This was obviously before text messaging and emails, but you could get your message, like you could say something strange and the person on the other end would know that that was like a yes or a no or I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> but you would just say something. Right, like some, a little clue. Like a, a code, code, like a code, like a secret right. code. And that way you didn't have to pay for the calls because back then long distance calls were expensive. They were really, really expensive. I can remember New York to Los Angeles in the 70s was three, four dollars a minute. And you're wow. thinking that's in 1970s money when minimum wage was a dollar sixty five. So it was really expensive to call back then. And it sounded terrible. You you know, if we think Skype sounds bad sometimes, (laughs) the phone conversations in those days, you had to yell and cover the other ear. And That's so fun. Isn't it crazy how much technology has changed in the time, you know, that we remember to now? And just imagine what it's going to be like the next generation coming up. Well, that's true. And if you think about the technology, it seems to change radically, at least it has, on the the century marks. I mean, in this right. case, we had a millennial. But in the century marks, if you think about what changed from 1899 to 1900 in that period, they mm-hmm. got electricity, they got telephones, they got cars. It all right. started right around then. So, you know, that was as huge as what we got with the Internet, I think, you know, for those people who grew up without electricity. And then, you know, think about how many things are becoming obsolete. I saw a tweet on Twitter yesterday, which was about information and are you addicted? It was called, are you addicted to social media? And there was a little test that you took to see if you were or you weren't. But then I, I, my reply to the guy, I don't remember who it was, who put up the post was, so what are we supposed to do, sit around and read the newspaper? Well, exactly. I mean, just think about how few people, when we were growing up, everyone got a newspaper. Did you get a newspaper? We did. I used to deliver newspapers when I was a kid. <laughs> right, so everybody got, mostly everyone got a Sunday paper, and a lot of people got the weekday paper. And right. sometimes, in well, Baltimore had a lot of newspapers because we were a big town. So we had more than one daily paper. And our biggest paper had a morning edition and what they called the late edition. So the news, as the news changed, it, the headlines and all d- differed. So I don't even know, and I was asking my sons because they're both like, like in their 20s, how things have changed. I said, do you guys know anybody that gets a newspaper? Do you guys even read magazines? Remember when everyone's coffee table was full of the latest magazines? Oh, sure. Yeah, everything's quick info and everything's on the phone and on the computer. Right, and on the pad. In mm-hmm. fact, when we when we built this house, one of the things that we did was we specifically put plugs in places that you would never have traditionally thought to put plugs because we thought, Okay, the couch is going to go here, so we want the plug over your head, over your shoulder, so you can plug in your iPad. Right. And that was the idea, where before people always put the the plugs 
on the baseboards, you know, like right. behind the couch and you had to move the right. couch. So and, they wouldn't show the wires of the lamps or whatever. Right. But now it's it's like a whole uh, whole different yeah, game. Yeah, because back you then you'd the plug plans. something in and it would stay plugged in. You'd right. plug in the floor lamp and it would stay plugged in until you, you know, shampooed the rug or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Woo, something. Well, well, there's our trumpet fanfare. That's going to be a new feature here on the Douglas Coleman Show. If you hear the trumpet fanfare, it means that we have a new announcement to make, uh, something that we have not talked about or some kind of a big promotion. And as it happens, we do. We have a promotion for a new online theater show called The Burbs. And The Burbs is written and produced by Leanne Moonraven, who is also doing Achilles the Hit. I am going to be the narrator and the editor for this project, and I'm really excited about it. We've put out some pictures and promos on Facebook and Twitter, and where else did you promote it? We also have promotions up on LinkedIn. We're planning on doing a release through the blog and the press release service that we have because I'm going to be doing PR for this series, The Burbs. Right. Lady Lake Entertainment is the official mm-hmm. official uh, yes, publicist Yes, we are. I signed the all the papers the other day. That's great. Well, it's we... very exciting. From what I've heard, I've heard, of course, the intro, which is very creepy. I know everybody's going to love it. Any fans of mystery and horror... I don't know if you've ever heard it, Douglas, but I used to listen to something called Radio Mystery Theater off of CBS Radio in, I would say, the late 70s. It came on on Sunday night, fairly late, maybe 10, and I'd listen every week. It was after Dr. Demento, so... Okay, <laughs> well, I don't remember did. that. Remember reading about the old, like, The Shadow and Orson Welles' right, War of the right. Worlds and things that they used to do in the 40s before television, and people would mm-hmm. sit there and would listen. And this is kind of based on that idea, only mm-hmm. we've, you know, modernized it, so we're not using crumpling tin foil to represent lightning, and, you know... We We've got like real good digital effects for the show. And uh, so it's a modern twist on that concept, though. So you can listen to this on your iPhone. If you're driving, you can listen. It doesn't require you to watch it. It's only a listen. And And that's what's so interesting about it, because just like when you read a book, your mind will create the images of what you think the characters would look like, what you think the house would look like. Uh, Well, we have the opening narration here, so let's have a listen to this. We forgot to mention that the first episode will be 10 p.m. on October 1st. For more information, please go to CarmenTheaterOnline.com. Good evening. Welcome to the Carmen Online Theater Group's presentation of The Burbs. After the sudden and unexpected death of her husband, Lisa Sheridan and her 14-year-old daughter Brittany decided to start their lives over by moving to a new town. Lisa feels that leaving their old home and neighborhood and making new friends would be good for Brittany, an only child. It didn't take long for Lisa to find a location she felt suitable for her and Brittany. Because of the money left to her by her husband's substantial life insurance policy, Lisa knows that at least financially, she won't have to worry about surviving. Although their loss is great, both mother and daughter are glad to be together and starting the next chapter of their lives. If they had only known what awaits them. Well, I 
love it. It's so <laughs> creepy. So anyways, October 1st, 10 p.m. Oh, and it looks like Periscope Girl's calling in now. So let's check in with her. Hello, Periscope Girl. Hi, hi, Captain. Hi, Cindy. Periscope Girl reporting. Shiver my timbers. You can now broadcast and view in landscape mode on Periscope. Also, you can share live broadcasts as they're happening on Facebook. If you're watching a broadcast live, then just swipe the screen to the right and you'll see the share icon. Note, you need to have Facebook app ready on your phone to use this option. Well, blow me down. The word on the wind is that Periscope has gone and developed its own app for the new Apple TV, which will let you watch Periscope live streams on your TV as they happen. So, my hearties, I've been watching other people's scopes and I got to see the Empire State Building in its patriotic colours as a mark of respect for 9-11 and I took a screenshot of it. It's going to be Scope Week in New York next week, the 22nd of September, where all the periscopers of the world will meet up. Aye, but London is to have its own event on September the 16th and I plan to weigh anchor to attend. Well, Captain, I'll be shoving off now. Got to scrape some barnacles off me rudder. Periscope girl, over and out. Okay, thank you, Periscope girl, for that excellent report. Down she goes, down, back into the North Atlantic again. That kills me every time, that's so funny. And now, once again, it's time for Lady Lake Corner. Hello and welcome to Lady Lake Corner for the week of September 15th through the 22nd. You can visit our talented roster, complete with photos, tour updates, and music samples at ReverbNation.com slash label slash Lady Lake Music. This week, we have Chicago area band Villa Avenue in the spotlight. They're coming up at the Uptown Lounge in Chicago on Saturday, September 19th at 9 p.m. This club features an impressive 150 plus list of craft beers. So they have my vote already, along with some super local talent. So stop by if you're in the area. The Uptown Lounge is located at 1136 West Lawrence Avenue in historic Uptown Chicago. For more information, please visit www.uptownlounge.net and for more on Villa Avenue, including their great music, check out their Reverb Nation profile at ReverbNation.com slash Villa underscore Avenue. That's it for this week's Lady Lake Corner. Okay, thank you very much, Cindy, for Lady Lake Corner. And we'll be right back with Nathan McCree after this commercial message. Bondi Guest House in Jomtien Beach, Patil, Thailand. And their guest house offers beachfront accommodations with all rooms having sea views. Some rooms have balconies overlooking the sea as well. The Jomtien nightlife is within an easy stroll and the beach is right outside your door. The attractions of Pattaya City nightlife are also just a few minutes ride away. Food is available 24 hours and offer a selection of European and Thai food. The owners, Colin and Malcolm, look forward to welcoming you to the Bondi. For more information, email Colin at Bondi Pattaya, B-O-N-D-I-P-A-T-T-A-Y-A, at yahoo.co.uk. And if you do contact them, please mention that you heard about it on Douglas Coleman's show. Okay, my guest today is a music composer and sound effects editor for multimedia projects, including computer games, television, live events, and radio. He worked with Core Design between 1996 and 1998 for the first three Tomb Raider games. In 2008, he became full-time audio director for Vatra Games, where he worked until 2010. After this, he became audio director at City Interactive in Warsaw, where he worked on Sniper 2, Ghost Warrior, and Alien Rage. Please welcome my special guest, Nathan McCree. 
Hello, Doug. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I wanted to ask you about when you write the music for the games. To be honest, I haven't actually played a video game since Nintendo, so <laughs> it's been a while. And I know that they've gotten quite a bit more sophisticated since then. When you do music for the games, do you actually watch the game and then sort of write the music to it, or do you just write music and retrofit it to the game? Um, it, it depends, really, on, on the project that I'm working on. Usually, I get full access to the game. I'm freelance in my studio here in Brno from in, in the Czech Republic, and um, many of my clients are from England and the States. So I work uh, remotely. I hook into their servers, I run the game engine on my laptop, and I, and I have full access to, to their builds. So I see the full content of the game and, and I will, you know, spec out where I think music should be going. Because, you know, a, a lot of the time I'm, I'm kind of like acting audio director for them, um, particularly with uh, mobile game companies. They have quite uh, a small team. Okay. So they usually don't have anybody uh, looking after the audio. So I sort of come in as a, as a freelance audio director and I spec out what they need musically and, and sound. So I will write things to fit particular locations that the player will go to, or you know, if we need certain menu music, you know, I'll be able to look at those menus and, and get a feel for the kind of style that we're looking for. So yeah, most of the time I get full access to the game. Sometimes I'm a little bit more external and you know, people have their their audio team in place. They just need a few tunes, you know. But usually, they'll they'll have some idea of what the music is for or where it's supposed to go. And you know, I'll, I will get at least some either text information or, or some you know screenshots or something. So it's similar to writing soundtrack for a film in that sense, yeah. Uh, yes, in that sense, um, but. With games, you know, it's not sequential uh, like a film is. You know, a film has a direct, uh, a definite sort of A to B scenario. You know, we, we don't have this in games. You know, we don't know how long the player is going to survive. We don't know whether they're going to go this way or that way or whether they're going to go back. Oh, right. And, yeah. Trace their footsteps, you know. So it's about creating textures more than uh, score music, which, which, you know, describes in films, you know, second by second. This is not really how we write music in games. Right. The film would have a certain continuity that you wouldn't have in games. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we do have video sequences in games which are kind of used to tell the story and, and they act as links from one level to another. Um, and for those video sequences, that they're sometimes three or four minutes long and there'll be several of those in the game. And, and, and that is exactly the same as writing for film. So there is some score writing involved, and there's also uh, textures, you know, looping textures as well. You had mentioned that you're living now in the Czech Republic, but I know from our, our mutual friend uh, Jane Yates that you are originally from the UK. Can you give us a little background on uh, where you grew up in the UK and uh, how you ended up in the Czech Republic? Yeah, um, I grew up in Lincolnshire, went to university in London, began my career working for Core Design in Derby. Then in 98, I went freelance. I set up my own music and sound production studio. I then had kids. <laughs> and well, that, that's a game changer. Yeah. And I continued being freelance. I moved to Oxfordshire. Um, and live, I was living in a little village just outside Oxford. Um, and I was freelance there for quite some time, about seven years. And eventually I was nudged by my wife to go back to full-time employment. I think she was looking for the regular salary you know <laughs> uh, which you know it wasn't such a bad thing for me to do at that time um you know i progressed up the career ladder there and i i, I was working for zoe mode in brighton where i was uh, audio manager and one of their sister companies was vatra games in Brno in the czech republic and they needed some extra audio support on uh, two of their projects one was russian attack which was a remake of Konami's coin-op game of the same name. I think in America it was called Green Beret. So we did a remake of that. And so initially I was on a, a contract for three months just to kind of help out with that project. But their second project, Silent Hill Downpour, another Konami franchise, um, that was also um, 
a little bit behind schedule uh, and just suffering really from lack of manpower on, on the audio front. So I, having talked to the studio head time, I, I said, look, you know, would you be interested in me working on Silent Hill? And he said, yeah. So I, I quit Zoe Mode in Brighton and I went out to work full time for Varsha Games on Silent Hill as their audio director. So that's how I ended up here. In fact, you, you mentioned at the beginning um, that I came here in 2008. In fact, it wasn't until 2010 that I came to Brno, and I had two years with Vatra, and then I went to City Interactive in 2012. How far is that from Prague? It's about two hours, two hours southeast. All right. Are you still just uh, one hour or two hours ahead of London time? Uh, one hour ahead of London. You know what I don't understand about the time zones in, in this world of ours? is, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I live in Thailand for part of my year. And okay, the, lovely. And the other times I'm in Las Vegas. It's only a five-hour time change from Thailand to where you are in the Czech Republic. Right. But it seems like, distance-wise, it's a hell of a lot further than it would be from New York to Los Angeles, and that's a three-hour time change. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't really understand them. I mean, they're not straight lines, are they? Really? No. They sort of wiggle around countries and things. You know, and then... <laughs> I haven't quite worked it out. Because, you know, there's Spain as well, which is uh, plus one hours from London, but it's kind of directly south of London, which seems weird to me, because six o'clock in the morning, say when the sun rises, you would expect the people in Spain to see that sunrise at exactly the same time. And yet their clocks show one hour forward. So I, I'm, I'm a bit confused about it as well. Well, e even closer than that, if you just cross the channel from uh, Calais to Dover, it's a one-hour yeah, time change. Miles, isn't it? Isn't it? And it's only 20 <laughs> miles away, right. So uh, I don't get it at all. And, you know, New York to <laughs> London uh, mileage-wise is about the same as uh, from Bangkok to Tokyo. And yet from Bangkok to Tokyo is only a two-hour change, but from London to New York is five. Yeah, so I, it's, I, I don't understand it at all. Anyways, well, let's play one of your songs. You were nice enough to send some music. I like this one, Venice, Tomb Raider 2. Uh, anything you want to tell us about that, or should we just play it? Yeah, so this was, this was for a part in Tomb Raider 2 where Lara Croft, she, she's on the tray, she, she's in... She's on the chase, rather. She's trying to find Bartoli's hideout. And in this part of the game, she manages to get her hands on a speedboat and she goes racing around the canals of Venice. And it's a timed puzzle. So you have to do things in a certain order and there's not much time on the clock. So you have to do everything pretty perfect to, to complete this puzzle. And it climaxes at the end with a kind of James Bond moment where she's, she goes up a ramp in the speedboat and crashes through two glass windows to land on the canal on the other side. So it was quite a, it's quite a good moment in the, in the game. And I thought, well, what would be better to describe this than some Venetian music playing in the background? So I did a bit of research, listened to a few Venetian Baroque composers, um, you know, got a feel for style and instrumentation, that kind of thing. And away I went, and, I, and off I went and wrote this tune, Venice. Okay, well, let's have a listen. This is Venice by Nathan McCree.
very nice. You know, I have to admit, that, that one I heard, I, I did listen to before uh, the show. Like I said, I haven't actually played a video game since Nintendo. And I guess I was expecting kind of that silly video game type music. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know what to expect. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, oh, this is very classical. This is very nice. It uh, actually sounds like real music compared to the uh, Super Mario theme. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah nice. I mean, you know, when I started uh, in the games industry, we were working on uh, machines like the Sega Mega Drive, which were chip-based uh, machines uh, in terms of their audio uh, capabilities. So, um, yeah, you know, my life started with chip tunes, th that kind of plinky-plonky sound that I, I guess you were expecting. Right, right. Uh, but in 1994, um, the Sega Mega CD console came out, and the Amiga CD32, and these were both, as their name suggests, CD-based consoles. So for the first time, we were able to produce full quality music in, in video games, and we really had to kind of step up our game. And it was quite daunting to think, you know, we were now sort of competing with uh, film soundtracks and, and other music artists in the industry. So, I mean, that piece, although it sounds orchestral, um, it's actually made on synthesizers, I, at the time, I didn't have uh, any sample players either, so it was uh, yeah, pu purely synths alone. It's it's not a bad sound. I mean, obviously, I, I, I could pick holes in it. It certainly made an impressive sound um, for what was going on at the time. Oh, certainly. And I don't think anybody's going to say, oh, well, he didn't use a 40-piece orchestra for that, so I'm not going to buy the game. You know, that's ridiculous. It's it sounds. Well, no, it's, it's it's not that they're not <laughs> going to buy the game, but um, you know, there are radio stations which won't play electronic, you know, orchestral music. They they want a live orchestral production, or or it doesn't get played. Th that's starting to change. I mean, you know, they are they are starting to play games music a lot more these days uh, on radio. Um, but some of the channels are still um, requesting, you know fully orchestrated recordings. Just for live performance? You mean on the classical stations? Or? Yeah, yeah, things like the classical stations, yeah, they're, they're, they're wanting live orchestras. If, if they can get them, good. It's uh... it's gone up lately, you know, <laughs> games are big business now and they're spending, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds on them, so, you know, the budget for the audio is much bigger and, and, and many of the games now do in fact feature, you know, live orchestral recordings. Well, actually, that's encouraging. Um, I, I don't mind synth music, but I'm always, I've always been an advocate of sort of real music, and I always have this, uh, this big gripe about the major labels, record labels, that are just putting out completely electronic music. Even mm. even that the vocals, the singing is so overprocessed. I'm with you on that. You know, I I do prefer um, you know live instruments. It, it's a much more expressive sound. And you know, I'm I'm hoping that uh, uh, you know I've got a few projects up my sleeve, which hopefully I'm going to see to a live orchestra soon. So you know, keep your ear to the ground. I'll I'll keep you posted on that. What sort of music did you listen to as a kid growing up? Well, I wasn't unusual in terms of you know the sort of the pop music that everyone was listening to at the time I, I was in on all that scene I remember the police featured quite heavily in my repertoire when I was young oh, okay. uh, and I listened to lots of you know he heavy rock bands like Def Leppard and Rat and Led Zeppelin and things like this so you know I and, and lots of electronic music as well you know did uh, in the 80s there was all that sort of big sort of wave of electronic music so I listened to a lot of that but I also listened to a lot of classical music um, because my dad was uh, quite into that, and he used to he used to sit me down and force me to listen to stuff, <laughs> which at the time I wasn't too keen on. But later I realised the benefit of you know having had that kind of education. And I also was um, I was singing in a church choir from quite a young age, so I had quite a lot of quite a lot of choral uh, musical background as well. So you've got a very diverse background for music, which would certainly help you writing for games, because I, I would imagine that writing for games, you would need all sorts of uh, different styles and genres of music. Absolutely. Um, my job is to write either what the client wants or what's right for the game, and that can be any style at all. So, uh, you know, a composer's job is to 
to write what style is needed. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I I try and do my best at that. All right, let's uh, let's have a listen to another one. Which one? Uh, which one do you want to listen to? I'll let you choose one. Uh, well, let's listen to. Well, let's go for number two, shall we? Let's listen to Tom's theme. Okay. So, this was written for a film um, about this little lad whose dad was a an aerobatics pilot. Tom used to go and watch his dad performing at these air shows, and one day something went wrong with the aircraft, and his dad lost control and and crashed. And Tom saw this happen, so which was obviously very traumatic for him. And there's a point in the film where Tom is thinking about his dad and he's sat at the piano, you know, quite miserable, just tapping a, a single note. And out of that develops this piece of music, which, is, which I've called Tom's Theme. Okay, let's listen to Tom's Theme by Nathan McCree. Oh, very nice. I like that um, sort of warpy sound. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it other than... <clears throat> yeah, I was, I was trying to kind of describe, you know, his aeroplane doing loop-the-loops and stuff. So, it's, yeah, it's sliding, sliding brass and violins. Yeah. Are you strictly an um, ear composer or do you uh, read and write music as well? You know, sheet music? Uh, yeah, no, I, I studied music uh, and, yes, I read and write. Um although most of my writing comes from pressing the record button and, and playing the piano. So, you know, I don't do too much pencil to paper. Um, you know, once it's in the computer, I can, I can print out the score from there. Uh, but yeah, you know, I studied music. I, like I said before, I did lots of singing. I studied the piano, studied music to uh, in England to A level standard but I decided you know when I went to university I would do something which I, I could guarantee earned me money so I studied uh, software engineering and computer science so you just sort of blended the, the two talents together yeah well yeah you know the the computer si the computer science side of things actually got me my first job with core design I, I was a programmer there uh, coding a, a music sequencer for the mega drive I finished that a piece of software a little bit ahead of schedule so I, I said to my boss you know look I'll write some music on it and show you what it can do and when he heard the music he said oh that, you know that's really great do you want to 
do you want to write the music for for one of our games? So of course I said yes, and and, and that was that really. I had a job change overnight, and, and yeah, never done any programming since. Well, not really. <laughs> I want to go back to Tomb Raider for just a, a moment because uh, I'm sure everybody's seen the movie. The game obviously follows the movie somewhat. Uh, it's the other way round. The movie follows the game. The movie follow. Oh, I see. The, the, yeah, game? the game came first. Oh, it did? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. We, I mean, Tomb Raider 1, you know, the, the game was really successful. And then I think we did Tomb Raider 2. Yeah. And then Tomb Raider 3. And then there was the movie. No, I didn't know that. Because I was going to ask you if it was if the music of the movie would be any influence to the game. But obviously, if the game came first, that would be a ridiculous question. So I'll just yeah, skip yeah. that one. <laughs> you know, you know what, what I was hoping is that the, the music from the game would influence the music in the film. But that wasn't to be the case. So you yeah. didn't have any input in the, the music for the film then? Uh, no, I didn't. I was contacted about it, and I had talkings with Lloyd Levin. Uh, I went to Universal Studios to see him and we talked about the possibility of me writing for the film but at that time it was quite early in production and he was still looking for a director so he told me to kind of go and wait in England um, and he would contact me which he did. I met the director, I wrote him some music but in the end he decided to uh, use another chap, I think one of his friends so I understand it and yeah, so he ended up doing the score for the film. Oh, well. Um, what are you working on right now? I, I did see something on your Twitter that you were doing a narration for Firefly. The, the, the Legend of Firefly. Legend called. of Firefly, yeah. Tell us about that yeah, one. Yeah, this is uh, through a chap that I've worked with over here in the Czech Republic. He started making his own games and asked me if I would be interested in doing the, the narration because I, I was the only native English speaker that he knew, certainly <laughs> over here anyway. Yeah, so we talked about that and then he gave me the script and I did a few voice tests for him and he really liked it. We've done the first, um, they're called Shires and in each Shire there is something like eight episodes. So we've made the first Shire of the game on its first release and the, I think there is another nine Shires to come so there's really quite a lot of work to do there. Give me the definition of a Shire, is that a level? It's kind of like a level, yeah. I mean, the the game designer calls it a shire because it's like an area of the map. So as, as you progress through this particular shire, you sort of unlock little parts of it. And when you've unlocked the whole shire, then you complete that level and you move on to the next shire. Oh, I see. Like, okay, like Hampshire and... Uh... Worcestershire yeah. and that, that's Lincolnshire, it. Lincolnshire, no, Oxfordshire, Oxfordshire. Yeah. okay. Yeah, so I, I'm quite pleased about that. It's not my first voiceover role in games. I, I've done a few. I've been uh, the lead voice artist in it was a game called The Regiment for Puju, I think it was, was it a Headstrong Studio, I think, um, in London. Uh, that was back in 2005. I've done other cameo roles in, in, in the Tomb Raider games. Yeah, bits and bobs here and there, you know. Whenever there's VO needed, uh, you know, sometimes things are missed in the script, you know, and, and, you, and you forget to record them at the studio or something, and, you know, somebody has to kind of pick up the, you know, the bits that are missed and, right. and get them in the game, and that usually ends up being me. Um, let me ask you something about the video game uh, business. Is it saturated like the music business is, or is it still a sort of elite group of people that are creating the games? Or is this something that anybody with software and a, and a computer can do at home? We have a kind of hardware life cycle of about five years. Every five years, something big changes in, in the hardware. Either there's a new console or there's some major new graphics card or something. It sort of, it opens up the market again to, to new developers that are coming into the industry. Particularly, for, here's one example, you know, um, over the past few years we've just had, you know, the introduction of the smartphone and, you know, the iPad. Right. So we have these what we call mobile platforms and with that there are new software companies that were building uh, game engines which you, which you use to, to make games, things like Unity. Because the, the mobile game market, um, you know, because the devices are quite small, the games are much smaller. So that opened up the market for smaller teams and splinter teams that, you know, break off from the bigger companies. They decide to, you know, leave for whatever reasons and they set up a small team of 
five or eight people and they make their own game. So at the moment, it's really anybody's game. You know, there are thousands and thousands of apps uh, and, and people are, yeah, people are making games as fast as they can. There is a core group of about maybe 50 companies worldwide that consistently uh, make high quality games but they have lots and lots of money and lots and lots of people so all right so it's it's not uh, well I guess what I'm trying to say is if you look if you're trying to compare this to the music industry where mm -hmm. back in the 80s unless you had fifty thousand dollars and an entire room to dedicate to a music studio you couldn't possibly compete with Capitol Records to create right. an album of the same quality that Elton John was creating at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, people with a computer and Pro Tools can pretty much do anything that the major labels are putting out. I'm just wondering if the same rule applies to video games. Yeah, I, th I think, like I say, o over the last sort of three to five years with, with these mobile platforms, yeah, it's kind of become anybody's game now. It is possible to make a small game to a very, you know, very high standard for little money. It certainly doesn't cost millions of pounds like, you know, it used to five or ten years ago. You know, now you can make a game for just a few thousand pounds. And, and it's possible to make quite a lot of money from that. And of course, because the internet is so much better now, we're, we're not really selling box product, as it were. We're selling downloads. And so with that, of course, you can, <clears throat> you can update your download or add more content. So you can start with something small, and then if, you're, if you get a good fan base for that and, and people are, are buying that app, you can then bolt on extra levels, you know, extra story, this kind of thing, and, and expand the game as you acquire more money. Yeah, I think it's not a saturated market, but I think it's anybody's game. Anybody with the technical know-how should be able to make a game now. You do have to have more knowledge to create a game than to create a three-minute song. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a whole lot more that goes into it. You know, you have programmers, artists, animators. Um, obviously, you've got your composers. There's sound designers. There are game designers, which, you know, design the levels and the puzzles and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, they're much bigger teams in that respect. Right. But from a musical point of view, um, you know, the technology has improved such that, you know, even that orchestral sound, which I was making back in 1990, six you know that the technology now is such that you know the orchestral scores really do sound like a real orchestra if it's done correctly it's very difficult to tell the difference and of course it can be done at a fraction of the cost you know there's a lot more uh, one-man band orchestral producers writers and producers that are that are making orchestral music than there was you know 20 years ago how many of the major film studios do you know would still use a full orchestra and record them to do some soundtrack? Um, I, th I think the big companies do. You think they still it's use? Yeah. To say. You know, you, you get you get some artists which you know which do use live orchestras. Some uh, use a combination of both. They use some live instruments and some electronic stuff. And there's others that, you know, are just producing it solely electronically with, with sample based libraries. Um, so I really, I think it really depends on the on the budget that the production studios uh, have to spend. I think if they've got the money, I think they still do tend to use live orchestra. I think just for the prestige of it, you know, and, and of course, you know, selling soundtracks after the film release, that also, I think, does better if it's a if it's a, a live orchestra. You can advertise it more, can't you? You can say, well, oh, oh, yeah, play. well, sure, it's a bragging right. Yeah. There was something interesting about that on a few years back, maybe, uh, with the Musicians Union and the orchestras on New York's Broadway, where a lot of the Broadway theater owners wanted to get rid of the full orchestras and simply use uh, pre-programmed, pre-recorded music to uh, accompany the live theater shows. And of course, right. the musicians unions went ballistic and said that if you did that, you would not be considered a full live show and could not therefore advertise this way. And so, you know, they got backed into a corner and they kept the the full orchestras in the orchestra pits. I think that's, in a way, it's kind of fair play because if it is a live show, you, you kind of want to, you, you expect something live, don't you? Um, and, and oh, I absolutely. Think, yeah. You know, there, there are some amazingly talented musicians out there. I mean, the people that play in these orchestras are just phenomenal. Um, and it would be a real shame if, 
you know, there wasn't any work for them. I would be deeply saddened if that was the case. Oh, I agree with you. I think that, uh, you know, musicians have been losing a lot of ground to technology on one hand. But then on the other hand, it's given us the ability to produce, distribute and promote our own music without the help of a major label. Well, we've got time for one more song. Creatures of Light or Love You to Death? Oh, let's go for Creatures of Light. Okay, tell us about that one. <laughs> this is, I'll, I'll talk about the song title. So um, this actually started out being called Fever Swamp, and it was one of those file name titles. You know, I was working on a game called Goosebumps Horrorland. There was a, a level in there where the, the player had to make their way across this fever swamp. So, of course, you know, when I'm in a hurry and I'm writing stuff and I've got to get it all done, you know, sometimes there's not a time to, to think of a, a good name. So it was called Fever Swamp, but I changed it not too long ago. I decided to rename it and call it Creatures of Light. I think the title still works with the music. And I, I quite like this one. Quite sad, but also quite mellifluous. Oh, there's so, a good word. Yeah. That, that's a $5 word right there. <laughs> okay, let's have a listen to this one. This is Creatures of Light by Nathan McCree. Thank you. 
Yeah, that one had a very uh, sort of haunting and daunting feel about it. Yeah. Um, sort of uh, could be a soundtrack to, you know, a horror film. Well, the game was uh, children's horror. Children's so, horror. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't make it too frightening, but yeah, <laughs> it's got a creepy feeling to it. Sure. What would be the difference between children's horror and adult horror? Just the level of violence? In terms of game content, yes, of course. You know, it's more cartoon styled, I suppose, as opposed to, you know, real life gore, blood and guts, you know. <laughs> um, okay. And, and musically, adult horror music is, is really quite disturbing. We can't scare little children, you know, out of their wits too much. <laughs> so, you know, you have to just lighten it up a little bit. Of course, you can make them feel a bit unsettled, but, yeah, you, you don't want to scare the living daylights out of them. I suppose that's uh, a good thing to do. A good thing not to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Well, listen, we're just about out of time. I want to thank my special guest, Nathan McCree, music composer and sound effects editor for Multimedia Projects. Do you want to give out your Twitter in case people want to look at you and see what you look like and see what you're working on? And that sure. Kind of thing? Yeah, you can get me on Twitter. My handle is at NRP McCree. I'll spell that. It's NRP M-C-C-R-E-E. -E. And you can also find me on Facebook if you search for Nathan McCree. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. My and, pleasure. Um, we'll, now, the one uh, Legend of Firefly, is that, uh, when is that due out? Legend of Firefly is now released. Oh, all right. Uh, that's out. You can download that on Android. So, yeah, that's out. And there'll be, there'll be more Shires coming, more narrating coming in, in the very near future. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Nathan. You're welcome, Doug. Thanks very much for having me. Okay. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guest, Nathan McCree, for coming on the show. It was a pleasure talking to him. Best of luck to him. Also, thank you to Periscope Girl for that wonderful, enlightening report. And, of course, a special thank you to my co-host, Cindy Diadamo from Lady Lake Entertainment. Next week, we will have Leanne Moonraven. Uh, who we mentioned earlier, who is the writer and producer for The Burbs. And she will be on talking about uh, her movie, Achilles the Hit, and the movie industry, and all kinds of good stuff. So please tune in for That'll that That'll be next interesting. Week. Yeah, I think so. I think that's going to be real good. Okay, this is Douglas Coleman saying good night. <laughs>